All right, throw away shovelware. Ah, throw away shovelware. Let's see. Mmm. Nah, fuck that. Dedicated video. <sighs> One day. Yeah, you know that that'll work. Oh, I should probably grab this other one too. Ghost Sudoku was released pretty early in the PSP's life cycle, and it's based around the number puzzle game, Sudoku. You're likely somewhat familiar with Sudoku as puzzle books for it are pretty common. I didn't understand how to play before starting this episode, so let me explain how the puzzle works. You begin with a 9 by 9 grid made up of cells, some of which may already have numbers placed within them. You then fill in each cell with a number ranging from 1 to 9. The catch is that for every row and column, each number can only appear a single time. The same goes for each one of these 3x3 squares, called mini-grids. It sounds complicated, but as long as you remember these three rules, you can figure out what numbers go where via process of elimination. I find doing Sudoku puzzles relaxing, but I prefer them in a digital form, so Go Sudoku sounds right up my alley. Go Sudoku is overall pretty nice, but it controls a little weird. You can scroll through the numbers via L and R and select which cell you'd like to interact with using the control pad. Pressing cross will place your currently selected number in that cell. If that number conflicts with any of the rules about rows, columns, and mini-grids, the cell will turn red and you will receive a time penalty. Theoretically, you could just spam your way through since there's no real punishment that actually bars your progress, but it's not as easy as it sounds. Triangle functions as your undo button, allowing you to go back as many times as you need to. Pressing circle will place the number in the chosen cell as a candidate number. Candidate numbers, when used in conjunction with the three rules, helps you determine which numbers go in what cells. Now, square is kind of interesting. At first it seems like another undo function, but what it actually does is remove whatever instance of the currently selected number is available in that cell, whether that be a placed number or a candidate number. It might seem a little useless at first, but it's good if you accidentally stuck a candidate number in a cell early on and came back later and realized it doesn't belong there, but still don't have the solution for that cell. Having two buttons that do almost the same thing is a little unnecessary. It does seem a little overcomplicated for such a basic game. Once you get used to everything though, the game is... Uh... Okay? So, as I was saying, once you get used to everything, really, again with this? Okay. Okay, yeah, we're we're not we're not doing this. So, this game shipped with a game-breaking bug. Well, I guess game breaking is subjective, but having a text box that pops up during gameplay for zero reason is pretty game breaking to me. That's a great feature by the way, should advertise that in the back of the box. And yeah, honestly the game's really not that bad other than this one thing. I know I said I wanted to do some throwaway shovelware junk, but this game's actually designed for PSP. Hell, it's even one of those PSP games that had completely free DLC available online for it. That's such a waste, I always like seeing games that have that. I guess it's not truly game breaking, because you can just pause the game when it pops up, but let's be real, this breaks your concentration and I can't imagine anyone actually suffering through the game like this. And you know what? There's no reason to do so. This game is a PSP exclusive that was originally designed for the hardware, and I wouldn't feel right if I didn't give it a proper look. Typically in this kind of situation, I would look online and see if there's some kind of a patch, but we don't have that this time. This game was also released in Japan under the name Kazuo, but more importantly, in Europe in English. Don't expect this to happen a whole lot, but we're gonna examine the PAL release of this one. As far as I can tell, everything is the same, bar the download new puzzles option being grayed out. I cross-referenced the number of puzzles for both versions, and it seems the DLC puzzles aren't in this game. However, that bug is fixed, so let's give this thing a proper look through. Teach Me Sudoku contains the tutorial and training. Tutorial does a decent job explaining the controls as well as the rules of Sudoku, and training lets you do five easy puzzles with help turned on. This all works as intended, but the approach feels a little mechanical and dull in my opinion. I guess accomplishing a goal is better than outright failing it, but it's just not very interesting. Solo Sudoku is a single player game. 
choose between four difficulties in the specified puzzle, or hit square to choose randomly. There's also an option to change the background between a few styles, which is pretty cool. It includes a slot for a custom image using a picture saved to your PSP, but I couldn't get it to work. I have a suspicion that it may work on certain PSP system firmwares and was broken via updates. Now let's look at the multiplayer modes. In past Sudoku, you and up to four friends take turns inputting numbers on the board, with the goal being to input more numbers faster than the other player. This is pretty nice because it can be played with just a single PSP. Wireless Sudoku has a few options underneath it. In battle mode, you compete with other players to fill out as much of the same board as possible. Placing incorrect numbers in this mode results in having your controls locked up for a bit, so you need to plan your moves carefully. In versus Sudoku, you and a friend compete to finish the same puzzle first. And finally, Game Share Sudoku allows you to send a bite-sized version of the game to a friend. All in all, the game's not really anything to write home about. The core gameplay is passable, and the extra modes are nice, but outside of that, it's nothing special. It's just... okay. This game is pretty cheap secondhand, but the US version is out of the question in my opinion. Even then, this isn't exactly a game I'd be clambering to play. Thankfully, we have lots of other options. Sudoku games are a strong topic for an early episode, because the PSP has a grand total of 10 that were released across the various regions, with Japan getting the bulk of them. There's 8 in total, including Kazuo, which I mentioned earlier. If you're wondering why Go Sudoku was renamed to this in Japan, it's because of a copyright. The word Sudoku was actually coined in Japan by the company Nikolai, despite the puzzle originating in another part of the world as a number puzzle. It's exactly the same as the other versions, but the option to download new puzzles has been removed entirely. This one here was developed by Hudson Soft, which I personally found a little bit interesting, and yes, these four down here are all different games, even though they look extremely similar. And that brings up a good point. I can't read Japanese, or most other languages for that matter. So unless a game from a foreign country has an English language option, or a fan patch, it's off limits for this series. In fact, uh, just to really drive this point home, while I was working on editing this video, I actually discovered that I missed three more Nikolai Sudoku games. And um, I just found them randomly without looking for them. So situations like this make me really shaky on speaking definitively. When I can't speak Japanese, I can't read Japanese, I really have no idea what I'm doing on that side of the web, so in 99% of cases, we're not going to be talking about stuff that is in that language. Because of the language barrier, I'm just going to avoid it whenever possible. I will make a few exceptions for games that are more gameplay focused, but don't be expecting to see that too often. These two games here are special. While both of them are in Japanese, there was a version of one that was released in Europe. Europe only got two unique Sudoku games, so let's take a quick look at them. Keep in mind, when I say unique, I'm referring to the fact that they were released in the English language, but not in North America. Something I've learned while collecting for PSP is that oftentimes if you look across the pond, you'll find some great games that never came out in the US. I've found a lot of unique games this way, so it's taught me not to discount any at first glance. Magic Sudoku is actually pretty good and has some excellent music and sound design, although I dislike how you can only put four candidate numbers in a cell versus all nine possibilities. Zendoku is a lot like Puzzle Quest Challenge of the Warlords if somebody dumped Pocky all over it. In other words, they took a simple concept and spiced it up with some theming. Although if I'm being honest, this art style seriously isn't for me. Game's not bad though. It seems confusing at first until you realize different symbols of varying colors are more easily recognizable compared to plain old numbers. This is actually fairly good game design if I'm being honest. Now, now, games like this that are available in English, but only in Europe, I refer to as PAL region English exclusives. This might surprise some people that are not from there, but not every game that comes out in that part of the world is even in English. There's a lot of games that fit into this criteria, in order to not miss out on anything, I've decided to talk about them at length in their own dedicated series. There's also two Sudoku minis that were released on PlayStation Network, being Sudoku, nice title guys, and Telegraph Sudoku and Kaguro. These aren't anything special, and because they're download only, we won't be covering them here. However, minis and other download only titles will get their own time to shine. We've gone over almost everything Sudoku related on the PSP. Typically, I won't be taking this very broad, multi-region approach, but I wanted to establish the rules in order to avoid repeating myself in the future. However, we still have one more game to look at, and I've saved the best for last. Now, 
If you're from the US like I am, you're probably thinking the exact same thing I did when I first saw this game. Who's this broad? No, but really, who the heck is this? The game looks like one of those celebrity tie-in games, but I've never heard of this one before. Initially, I thought it may have been a Mavis Beacon teaches typing situation, but no, she is real and actually pretty famous. Just not in the US. Afternoon. Afternoon. Countdowners everywhere, all over the place. We know they're in here. And I have to tell you, it's just a special episode today. Countdown today is 25 years old. And that lady standing there by the board, looking like a, a Grecian goddess today, oh. or an Egyptian oh. goddess, probably, Clear did punch. every one of them, four and a half thousand, thereabouts, there maybe a few more. Carol enough. Vorderman, doesn't oh. she deserve... <laughs> And you know what? I've been on this show 25 years and I'm still only 32. Yes. It's amazing. Yes, we've got to check your maths on that sometime. <laughs> Carol Vorderman is most well known as being the co-host for the game show Countdown. So is she like a Vanna White from Wheel of Fortune? You know, talks very little, is mainly there to look pretty and operate the display. Nine and ten, four and seven, nine again and 75, and a target of, they're all low at the moment, aren't they? 313. Yeah, 313, 313. Lillian? 312. Oh, right, Lillian, go on. 75 times 4 is 300. 75 times 4 gives you 300. 10 plus 9 yeah. is 19. Yeah. Minus 7 is 12, yeah. Add that on. And you've added that on, Lillian, yes, 312. Yeah, yeah well, a very good stab for 7. Now, what about that 313? OK, 9 over 9 is 1. Add that to the 75. That gives you 76. Multiply it by 4. Uh, oh, hang on, what have I done now? No, I meant 10 minus 9, sorry. Is 1. Buh, 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 buh. That gives you 304, and then you've got the other 9 to add on. That's right. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, definitely not. Carol is a force to be reckoned with and the most important component of Countdown, in my opinion. With her quick wit and an IQ of 154, she's able to bounce off whoever is hosting very well. I was going to say Happy Independence Day to all our American viewers. I, we, we probably haven't got any, actually, because... Well, no, we have. No, well... We have. Ever since, well, ever since we disallowed American spellings, they've probably all no. deserted us. No, no. George Clooney watches Countdown, <laughs> and he's sure. American. Clooney. Yeah, it does. <laughs> Apparently, yeah. Yeah, he George... was he was ill in bed in his hotel once, and he watched, flicked on and watched Countdown. So there's one American. Well, one American, but mm. but, 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 but who's steady George, girls, who's... steady, <laughs> steady. Who's George Clooney when you've got me? Because <laughs> no, I no, I don't get much praise. But what about Countdown? Was the first program ever broadcasted by British Channel Four, and has become its longest running and most popular show, with new episodes still airing today. In my opinion, it's one of the most entertaining game shows I've ever seen. It's easy to see why Carol is such a celebrity in that part of the world. In July of 2005, Carol expanded her entrepreneurial endeavors into Sudoku products, starting with the release of a TV special, Sudoku Live, where she played Sudoku with people on live TV. This was quickly followed up by a massive line of Sudoku products featuring her likeness. There's literally a ton of these, with most of them being books. There's Carol Voderman's How to Do Sudoku. Carol Voderman's master suit. So this is a pretty great image, am I right? Truth be told, trying to find out where it actually comes from was a total nightmare. The standard Google search links back to this article from Pocket Gamer, which mentions at the time in 2006, she was doing an interview about the game for British print magazine, MCV. You would think with that much info, I would be able to talk about the full article, but I can't find any scans of their magazines. Using the Wayback Machine, I was able to access an older version of their site that has an archive of their digital articles, but sadly, it lacks the print ones. I'm pretty sure that article is where this image originates from, but I can't 100% confirm it. Carol Voderman's Sudoku, the board game, and finally, Carol Voderman's Sudoku DVD game. All of these were released in the US, including the final game for this video, Carol Voderman's Sudoku for PC, PS2, and PSP. I was able to look at all three versions a little bit. The PS2 and PC releases seem to be identical, judging from this lone screenshot I was able to find of the PC version. However, the PSP version is slightly different in its menu designs and has a renamed multiplayer option. Carol Voderman's Sudoku came out in North America on March 6, 2007, a little over six months after its original British release on August 25, 2006. 
It was also released in Germany under a different name, whose English translation is The Sudoku Coach. I'm not sure why her name was removed from the title, because it's the exact same as every other version, which features her likeness prominently. The history and the origins of Sudoku. So, where did this phenomenon begin? Well, what we now call Sudoku actually started out as a little-known 18th century number teaser called Latin squares. It was invented by a Swiss mathematician, and Latin squares remained relatively unheard of until it was reinvented as number place by an American magazine in the 1970s. In turn, a Japanese magazine then copied this basic concept of number place and launched the game as Sujiwa Dokushin ni Kagiru, which roughly translated means the number that is limited only to unmarried or single. The game was an instant success in Japan, where number puzzles have traditionally been as popular, if not more popular, than crosswords are in our culture. Sujiwa Dokushin Nikagiru was soon abbreviated, thank goodness, to Sudoku. Su as in number, and doku meaning single. Sudoku finally appeared in Britain in November 2000. The game starts up with a video of Carol briefly detailing Sudoku's history. There's an option on the main menu that features more of these videos, where she'll teach you the rules, guide you through an easy puzzle, and give tips for beginners and seasoned Sudoku players alike. These videos are great and are actually how I learned to play Sudoku for this episode. Carol makes for an excellent teacher and uses repetition to make sure what she's teaching sticks. And that's honestly a massive point in this game's favor how well it teaches you how to play. I think using this game, anybody could learn how to play Sudoku. There's 15 of these videos with a total runtime of under 45 minutes, with the longest one going through a puzzle step by step. Only the first two are required if you want to know how to play the game. The rest of them are for if you need extra help or want some tips on how to get better. However, outside of some still JPEGs appearing in the menus, that's the extent of how much Carol is featured in this game. There's a little more of her in the other versions, but the PSP version trades her out on the puzzle screens for HUD and playing space. If you still find yourself needing some help, the game offers four different assist functions under the options menu. However, turning any of these on results in the board becoming a practice board that doesn't award any score. Any high scores you achieve will be kept track of under the high scores option. Alright, now that we've got all that out of the way, let's take a look at the real meat of this game. The amount of content in this game is absolutely mind-boggling. In terms of the single player modes, you've got Classic, which is just your standard pick up and play mode, where you play a random puzzle of your chosen difficulty. Oh man, you guys, you guys hear that? That's really good sound design. You'll hear it anytime you completely fill in a row, column, or mini grid. I do really like it, but I did notice that you'll also get it even if you complete a section incorrectly, which is a bit of a letdown. I think it's worth noting the music is also really nice too. Very relaxing. I've often enjoyed using this game as a way to unwind at night. Next up is Arcade, which has a slew of modes all to itself. In Beat the Clock, you need to complete the puzzle before time runs out. In Extra Time, you gain more time by placing correct numbers and can even combo them to gain even more time. In Perfection, mistakes and candidate numbers will add on to how much time you've taken. And in Three Strikes, you're only allowed three mistakes before you fail the board. Despite the different play rules, all of these are pretty manageable on the easy difficulty, but get harder as the difficulty increases. Yeah, I know, no shit. But because each mode also includes the difficulty select, it means the game does an excellent job of exploring all of its own mechanics, as well as testing your own skills. This is something I notice is often left out of actual games, and it's really nice to see here. In career, you solve a certain number of puzzles in each belt tier until you can move on to the next belt. I thought it only used chosen puzzles for this mode, but these are randomly generated. I get the feeling they may adhere to certain creation rules relative to the belt you're on. The main point of career mode is to get you ready to challenge Carol. In this mode, you must complete 22 different puzzles while trying to beat Carol's best time. It's available from the start, so if you're confident enough, you could take her on immediately. I was able to clear the first couple of puzzles in this mode without completing career. The game also has three multiplayer modes. Head to head is the only mode that requires two copies of the game. You both work on the same puzzle independently to see who can finish it fastest. The next two modes can be played with a single PSP. 
and in quick fire, you take turns inputting numbers to see who can claim the most cells on the grid in the shortest time. Incorrect placements will cost you time, and the other player can't see any pencil marks you make. In Time Attack, you both work on a separate puzzle, and get a set amount of time to place numbers before it's the other player's turn. Before you start a match, you can select the default amount of time each player will get. Placing an incorrect number will cause the other player to get twice as much time as normal. And that's pretty much it. As you can see, Carol Voderman Sudoku has a completely insane amount of content, despite being such a simple Sudoku game. There's only one more mode to talk about, and the thing is, I think it may technically mean this game has infinite puzzles. Advertised on the back of the box is a mode called Sudoku Solver. Basically, you can plug numbers into the grid, and if it has at least one valid solution, it will solve it for you. This mode can actually be used to solve the typical pen and paper Sudoku puzzles. The thing is though, it clearly has some type of algorithm that's able to solve any valid puzzle, which means the game is likely able to make them from scratch. I think the game randomly generates valid puzzles for you to play based on the difficulty you have chosen. This means you'll likely never get the same puzzle twice. In fact, how many Sudoku puzzles exist? 6 sextillion 670 quintillion 903 quadrillion 752 trillion 21 billion 72 million 936,960. Here's a summary from Business Insider. While playing through a Sudoku puzzle, the question of just how many of these puzzles are there may have popped into your head. You don't need to wonder that any further. There are an eye popping 6 sextillion 670 yeah, quintillion. Yeah, yeah, you get the idea. It's an incomprehensibly large number. I don't know if the game is actually able to generate that many. I'm sure there's some type of limitation in the algorithm it uses, but the back of the box claims it contains over 1 million. Even if it's not limitless like I suspect it is, that is still an insane amount of puzzles. So, with everything now wrapped up, what do I think? Well, for starters, the American release of Go Sudoku is complete crap. I'm sorry, but that game breaking bug is unacceptable for such a simple game. So zero out of 10. Frankly, I think the best thing about it is the manual has an advertisement for a better game on the back of it. Don't worry, we'll get to that one one day. Even though the power release works perfectly and overall the game technically is a PSP exclusive, it's just all right in the end, a five out of 10. It has nice presentation, but the interface is annoying to use and the lack of content dooms it. But Carol Voderman's Sudoku? It just blows all of its competition completely out of the water. With the absolute tsunami of modes it provides and its excellent sound design, it's a force to be reckoned with. And you know, I gotta say, it's nice to see a celebrity tie-in game that's not utter dog shit. That's a lot more than I can say for some other games of that ilk on PSP. He's calling. If I'm on spot with my predictions about Kara Voderman's Sudoku, it might be one of the best Sudoku games ever made. And honestly, I think that might make it one of the best PSP games. For that reason, I'm going to give Kara Voderman's Sudoku a 9 out of 10. I really think the only bad thing about it is that it doesn't feature Carol enough. Now, you've probably noticed that's a higher score than I gave Activision Hits Remix last time. Does that mean I think Carol Voderman's Sudoku is a better game? No. I have a bit of criteria when I grade things. For starters, I use the full 0 to 10 scale, so 5 is the baseline score rather than the more popular 7. Other than that, I look at four different factors. One, a game based on a pre-existing property needs to respect its source material, but it also needs to be enjoyable. You don't need to be 100% accurate, but should try to be unless you're doing your own thing. Two, gameplay is tantamount. It's a video game, so you play it. I think story and other aspects are important, but gameplay is a major factor. What is a game really if you're not enjoying playing it? Three, a game should achieve the goal it sets out to do, and then go above and beyond to be the best it can. Four, everything is given a fair shot. Anything has the capacity to be good, as long as it's made well. While Activision Hits Remixed is excellent, as a compilation title, it's still missing some games from the publisher and has a few flaws. However, even though Carol Voderman's Sudoku is just a Sudoku game, it's an amazing one. 
It has a goal it wants to accomplish, and it does so with flying colors. I don't necessarily think it's a better game than Activision Hits Remixed, just fantastic in its own right. I could compare it to other Sudoku games, but not so much to a retro game compilation. To put it more bluntly, it's apples to oranges. Yeah, they're both fruit, but you wouldn't say an apple is literally an orange, would you? I recommend both of these games, and I think you should play whatever interests you. I want to close things out today by saying thank you to everyone that's been patient and stuck with me. I'm really excited to tackle the PSP library. It's been a long time coming, but it's finally here. And you shouldn't have to wait too long for next time either, because we're going to be taking a look at Adventures to Go. See you then.